Um, welcome back to Data Science Minicom. So, um, so next up we have Kendrick. Kendrick's an undergraduate student um, and also a machine learning engineer. So, so well done. Um, must be quite busy. So, um, so he's trying to um, write music, but uh, he wants a computer to do it instead. So, um, so he'll uh, work us through how that works. So, um, so welcome, Kendrick. Hello. Hello. Is this, is this working? Um, so I would like to first start off this by saying that this isn't a sponsored talk by PyTorch or Facebook. But if you guys are out there, I wouldn't mind some sponsorships. <laughs> um, so um, who am I? I'm, uh, ooh. Uh, I'm Kendrick, and my languages of choice are Python and Haskell. And I'm currently pursuing my Bachelor's of IT at the Queensland University of Technology. It's a kind of work in progress at the moment. Might not finish it, I don't know. Um, so in my day job, I work as a machine le learning engineer at popgun.ai. And we try and kind of teach computers how to interpret music and response, um, interpret and response to music. So even though my day job sounds fancy, this, is, this XKCD comic kind of reflects how I feel. I'm just kind of stirring a big pile of matrices to try and fit my data in. So what this talk covers is why you should use PyTorch and not, say, the 16 different other frameworks out there like TensorFlow, MXNet, Cafe, Tino, and so on. Um, what this talk isn't covering, however, is me explaining backpropagation, regression, matrix multiplication, and so on. I don't claim to know everything, so if you feel like I got something wrong or you want to clarify on anything, feel free to hackle me, but I would appreciate if you don't harass me. Um, so these are a couple of thoughts that I aggregated from the machine learning subreddit and thoughts on using PyTorch. And the bottom one actually resonates with me so much whenever I write TensorFlow code. It's great when you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so there are many things today that I could talk about PyTorch. But today, I just want to focus on these five topics, a standardized um, minimal abstraction API. This results in a non-leaky abstraction, allows you to reason, um, to e easily reason with your code. Um, to all you researchers out there, I love your work, but the code you write is really, really hard to follow. You have, <laughs> you have a class get, that, get, get, that gets passed into a function, and the function implicitly mutates the class's state. And then you call several subclass functions to mutate the state again. It's just so hard to follow. Um, even worse when it's written in TensorFlow. It's just so hard to follow. Um, but with PyTorch, you're able to minimize that, that kind of layers of abstraction and have clear and concise code. Multi-GPU support on PyTorch is easy, as it should be. Um, for those of you coming from the NumPy or SciPy land, um, PyTorch has deep integrations with, Py, uh, with Python, so using PyTorch should feel like second nature to you. Um, a big part in machine learning is actually the data cleaning, data processing, data augmentation stage, and PyTorch actually has some pre, uh, it actually has some pre-built tools that allows you to leverage it so you can use your custom data set with ease, um, including the data augmentation and pre-processing stage. Um, PyTorch actually, actually runs in something called a, dy a, a dynamic computation graph, which is different from static computation graphs. And I'll talk a bit more on that later on. So this picture, this network picture, is just to give you guys a visualization on um, the neural, ne neural network that we'll be building later on in PyTorch to familiarize yourself, um, you guys, with PyTorch's API. We have 28 by 28 as the input. 32 as a hidden, and 10 as the output. Um, the numbers for the hidden layer were chosen arbitrarily, so pay no attention to that. And this is, this is how you define a fully connected network in PyTorch, which, which is what we did, which is what is shown in this picture. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see the network architecture being declared. And on the right-hand side, you can see it being constructed and called. So to define your network, your neural network, your class needs to inherit, inherit from 
porch.nn.module. And um, sorry, one if you can see here, I'm defining two class members in the constructor, FC1 and FC2. Now, FC1 is a linear, linear unit, a linear layer, which takes in 28 by 28 and outputs 32, which is the first half of this, this network architecture. And FC2 is a linear unit, which takes in 32 and outputs 10, which is the second half of this, of this network. Um, and you can see, um, so when the class is being called, it actually invokes the forward function, and you pass in a variable x as your input, as you can see here. Input is x. And so you pass the input through FC1, and you returned a 32 length tensor, and x is passed again into FC2, and you returned x, which is essentially what this picture does as a whole. And so the issue with this code is that it only runs on CPU. It's not CUDA supported, it doesn't, it isn't supported on GPU. To, to make it GPU compatible, what you do is call .cuda, and that's it. That is all you do to turn your CPU network into a GPU compatible network. How easy is that? That, that, that would have took me at least two hours in TensorFlow. But uh, in PyTorch, all I do is call .cuda. Now, there's one more issue with this, is this is only supported on one GPU, but say you, have, you want to parallelize it, what would you do? And then you, you kind of encapsulate an in, in, in data parallel. And that is it. That is how you have multi-GPU support for PyTorch um, networks. Look how easy it is, multi-GPU. GPU, now CPU, now back to GPU. Multi-GPU, <laughs> it's so easy. Oh. Um, so again, PyTorch has deep integrations with um, Python. And so say you have the output. So now you have your output. Uh, you want to, say, turn it into a NumPy array for whatever reason and chuck it into a CSV or something. Um, what you do is call dot .data dot .numpy, and you return a NumPy array. But if you're on CUDA, you call dot .cpu dot .numpy. That's it. Oh, there's actually a typo here. Sorry. If it's if CUDA, you call dot .cpu dot .numpy. Uh, ooh, sorry. And that's how you turn your tensor into a NumPy array. And to turn your NumPy array into tensors, all you do is call torch dot from NumPy and your NumPy array, and you return a tensor. Again, these features are baked into the framework for your convenience. You don't need to go to like a third-party contrib library to, to streamline this process. It's built into the framework. So a big part of machine learning, again, is the data preprocessing and data augmentation stage. Um, in PyTorch land, this is how it works. You have a data set, which you say you have a list of x and y's, which sits inside a data loader. The data loader's job is to augment and preprocess the data from your data set and batch them up and, put, and kind of feed it into your model. So normally, if you want to write a multi-threaded multi um, preprocessing utility, it could take you a couple, I don't know, for me, it took me a couple days. But in PyTorch land, it's very, very easy to do so. You define, to, to define your custom data set, you just need three special method functions. The constructor, get item, and length. So the constructor and, and, and your class needs to inherit from torch.utils.data.dataset. And there you have it. You have your custom data set ready to be put into your data loader. But say you want to populate your data set, all you do is this. In your init function, um, you supply, say, say, x and transforms. And transforms is a preprocessing utility which is built by the PyTorch team, which I'll, I'll talk about more in the latest slide. So as you can see, I'm just um, defining my class variable x as x and transforms as transforms. And when you index it, it gets x at that index. And if you defined a preprocessing or data augmentation step, it augments and or preprocess your data and returns x. 
the length of your data, well, length just, is just the length of your data, so yeah. Um, so going on to touch vision, uh, so transforms. Transforms is actually, a, is actually obtained from touch vision, which is a computer vision specific pre-processing library. There's also text and audio coming along, um, and they're all done by the amazing PyTorch team. So you can compose your transformations. So for example, oh, again, sorry, transforms contains the um, commonly used pre-processing and data augmentation functions like uh, scaling, converting your pillow array to a tensor, flipping your image or randomly cropping it, um, randomly flipping it and so on. So you can compose multiple transforms. So say I want to scale an image and I want to transform it to a tensor. So all, I can compose it into T2, and I pass T2 um, into my custom data set. So now when you call D set 2, it's act it actually returns you a 28 by 28 tensor. But if you call D set 1, it returns you an n by n tensor. So now we have our custom data set. Um, what do we do? How do we put it into the data loader? We just put it in as a special keyword argument as data, um, data set. And your, um, and your custom data set is now multi-threaded by default. And whatever transformations you define will be performed during runtime in multiple threads. And that is it. Your custom data set can now be can now be utilized and put into your model. So, all you do, so to use your data loader, all you do now is enumerate over your data loader, and you can sort of just pass x or y's into your, da into your model. Um, so uh, dynamic graph computation, or DGC, uh, is what PyTorch runs on, as opposed to static graph computation, which is what its cousins run on, such as Again, TensorFlow, Cafe, Tino, Torch. So a really good way to describe PyTorch is that you define your network by running it. But um, static, static graph computations, you define your network and then run it. So it, it's really hard to kind of visualize this process, so I included a, a GIF. So this is stolen from the PyTorch website. And so what you do is you kind of you kind of define your variables and describe how they interact with each other. And the graph is created during interpretation, rather than being interpreted then created. And you might ask me why? What's the benefit of using DGC over SGC? And um, here's a couple answers. Well, for starters, dynamic graph computation is actually really easier to debug than st static graph computation. If your little black box neural network suddenly threw an error in TensorFlow, you'd be greeted with like a 10 line stack trace, which is quite unideal when you're trying to debug it and you have uh, limited time. On PyTorch or, or in any other framework that utilizes DGC, you actually know which file and on which line your network failed on, which is really handy and saves a lot of man hours. You're able to process inputs of variable sizes in DGC, uh, which is really, which is, um, which is kind of like key when you're doing machine learning for um, text and audio. There is no TensorFlow sessions, absolutely none. And you can do some interesting stuff such as manipulate your gradients during runtime. Um, so this piece of code snippet, if you include it into your training logic, uh, you can clip away the gradients to prevent gradient explosion, which is quite handy when you're trying to train something that is really unstable during the initial stages, like a GAN. Uh, so one of the most common questions that I get asked from people who want to use PyTorch is how can I visualize my training output or progress? because there's TensorBot to TensorFlow. So what's there to, Vis uh, what's there to PyTorch? Well, the nice folks at Facebook actually created a, a library, oh, sorry, a tool, a very powerful visualization toolkit called Vistem. What's great about it is it's platform agnostic and you can communicate via HTTP REST, which is really handy 
Um, so this is a nice, vis a nice GIF on how it works. So yeah, you have Vistum for PyTorch. Uh, how do I go back? Present. Ooh. Um, so in summary, why you should use PyTorch? Uh, it has a non-leaky API. It allows you to easier reason about your code, especially when it's a black box code. Commonly used features are baked into the framework for your convenience, like converting from a tensor to NumPy, a NumPy to a tensor data augmentation, data pre-processing, multi-threading, and so on. Uh, I, I understand that community is a really big part of whichever framework we choose, and it has a really vibrant and supporting community on the, both on the forums and on the Slack channel. Plus, it has really good docs. And yeah, that's it. Any questions? So, sorry, what? This one? Yeah, so I think you mentioned here that you actually automatically get the multi-threaded yeah, um, so data loader. I mean, not native threads, you mean Python threads, right? Uh, I'm not too sure about that, but it's multi-threaded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked into it, but yeah. All right, uh, any other questions? Uh, th thanks for a good talk. Um, so you talked about why it's good to use PyTorch. What, what, why would you? What are some of its shortcomings, or why might you not use it? Hmm. Well, for starters, that, that's not a lot of the document. It's kind of still in beta mode, so the the API actually changes quite a bit, and you have existing modules which gets put into legacy modules. So if you if you want to run on the bleeding edge, it shouldn't be an issue. But if you want a stable production level sort of system, I wouldn't recommend using it. But if you're doing research, I would highly recommend it. Um, as for the shortcomings, other than that, other than the changing API, I haven't personally. Oh, um, that's not a lot of. That's not a lot about guides on how to use it online. When you compare it to TensorFlow, that's pretty much it. It's more the community rather than the framework itself. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Yep. Um, sorry, so you just said that it was kind of beta mode. Is there a date that you guys are working towards for when you're like planning on uh, releasing a stable version, or is it? Kind oh, of I'm not. A, I'm not part of the. No, the sorry. Do, do you know if there is a date? Um, so there's monthly releases on the website. So, but it's still in beta. So it's very rocky, very very unstable, as in the API. But you can fix that by kind of specifying a version, what version of PyTorch you want to use. Okay. So uh, do you know if there's a plan for a 1.0 or something like that where it starts? No. Seven? No? Okay. No. Um, any other questions? Uh, I've got one. Um, so you, it, it was probably just because you showed us the easy neural network. But yep. it seems to me that if you're defining the network in you know, par partial PyTorch and partial Python code, so for the forward function here, you can imagine if you've got tens of layers, you'll write a loop and then everything goes through a Python loop. Does that cause issues or do you have to use other PyTorch classes to, to resolve uh, that? So there's actually a module called nn.sequential. And so it's like you can compose multiple, t multiple layers together, which if you look at the source code, is actually just a for loop. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because that's one of the uh, one of the key bits about TensorFlow and NumPy and stuff like that is trying to push everything down to those lower layers and trying to come up to Python as as infrequently as possible. Yeah, so this kind of abstracts away that concept. So yep. w which is which is why I love it. So yep. you rarely see that. Rarely. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, any final questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And just